Welcome to Keynotes from Cornell University. I'm Nicholas Phillips. On today's episode, I'm joined by Dr. Samantha Shepard, the chair of the Department of Performing and Media Arts in the College of Arts and Sciences. On this episode, Samantha and I are discussing the impact Sidney Poitier, recently deceased Carl Weathers, and other black actors and actresses have had on Hollywood. Additionally, we'll discuss race films and some unknown but game-changing movies. Dr. Shepard, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really, really glad to be here. It's going to be a really fun and exciting conversation with you today. I know. I'm very excited. So, firstly, the most important question, what's your favorite movie and do you have a favorite actor or actress? I love how you lead with the hardest question to ever ask someone who studies film and media in general. And it's kind of really interesting because two years ago, Sight and Sound came out with their most recent, like, 100 favorite film list. And I was really lucky that they asked me to contribute. And, you know, it's a great thing that you get to talk about, you know, in global cinema, what are your what are the best top 10 films? And then you also get a chance to really talk about how making that list is really subjective. And of course, you're signaling to a certain kind of craft and style, a kind of impact, but also to like your own personal interest. And I mean, I had some like heavy hitters on there, you know, your Ali, Fear Eats the Soul, your Raging Bull, your Tongue's Untied. But I also had Sister Act 2 on that list. And that's because that's my favorite film. Um, and uh, it's surprising most people because they're saying, oh, wait, don't you do this for a living? Why aren't you saying something more, you know, dignified? Why aren't you giving me the, like, the latest Christopher Nolan? And it's like, but the thing is, your favorite movie has to be, number one, a movie that you're going to watch if you turn it on in a hotel room. You're going to watch and seek it out. You're going to own it. You're going to be able to quote lines from it. It's going to have made a huge impact on you in a really particular way. And I think with Sister Act 2, people forget that is a film about teaching. And so for me growing up, seeing that film, that I mean, it's about teaching in a choir and Whoopi Goldberg's like really actually a, a headliner in Las Vegas. So like as a Leo, that's my full energy, right? But then she's brought in to save this school by turning this, you know, ragtag group of students, kids into a choir. And so it was about the power of the arts, you know, the power of a good rap to get, you know, kids together. But it had like a lot of mini life lessons that I thought really at the time that I watched it as a young kid, it made a really big impact and it's kind of stayed with me. And it's just so deeply pleasurable. A young Lauren Hill in the film, it taught me, you know, if you want to pursue something like studying film for your entire life, that's not a, a wild idea. It was basically all summed up in an amazing scene between Whoopi Goldberg's character, Dolores, also known as Sister Mary Clarence, and Lauren Hill's character, Rita. And she says, you know, if you wake up in the morning and all you can think about is singing, you're supposed to be a singer, girl. and All I want to do is watch films and movie and talk about them with students in like a really critical and historical way. So like, that's what I should be doing. And so it created an entire life path. That's the impact of Sister Act 2. That is me. So that actually is my favorite film to watch. Not necessarily my favorite film to teach. I don't teach it at all, (laughs) but my favorite film to watch. But your other part of your question was about my favorite actor or actress. That's a little bit of a hard one as well, because it really... There's so many. I love Hollywood glamour. Like, I love a glammed out actress. Like, give me your Lana Turner's. Give me your Claudette Colbert's. Give me your Joan Crawford's. But then it's like Denzel. Yeah. Of course. (laughs) I mean, nobody's acting. I mean, the man could tell me he's my father right now. I believe him. Like, with the kind of ability to, you just, everything he can do. And I want him to do more comedy, but he just has this exceptional range. He's so well trained. And he's just, I mean, he's an actor's actor. I mean, it followed probably right behind like Robert De Niro. But, you know, some of those films, you know, De Niro goes a little too hard in the paint for me that I can't really <laughs> yeah, keep my heart going. But but um, it's Denzel. It's definitely Denzel Washington. Yeah, I would have to say Denzel. I was surprised by the sister act too, though. I know it was a little curveball a right there. I know. Threw me for a loop. I would have to say mine's probably Remember the Titans. Remember just, the Titans? Yeah, oh, left side, strong side. It. Yes. <laughs> just watch it on repeat constantly. It's my favorite movie. That's such um, an interesting thing, especially since it plays so interestingly with history and with melodrama. But we often forget that sports films particularly are like men's weepies. So it also makes sense that you would maybe like hold on to that because you're able to tap into this inner emotion that you wouldn't have allowed yourself in a regular kind of cry film for which that is totally a cry film. Yes, men's weepies. <laughs> yes. I have something to add to my vocabulary. <laughs> so, you know, getting back to our conversation, this is kind of your first time here. Mm-hmm. So I was hoping you could kind of give us a little bit of background. Um, you know, you have your PhD in you know, media studies and film. What got you interested in kind of studying film and its history and all that stuff? 
I think when I tell people when it comes to my trajectory as a film scholar and a writer and a speaker, it really began in college. But of course, you know, what you realize is you've been training your whole life. I loved movies. I loved going to the movies. We had a dollar fifty movie theater that I could walk to that was like right down from the Walmart and I could sneak in snacks from the dollar store. I would also go to the bathroom, wait around and go to another movie because I wasn't rich. So even a dollar fifty felt like a stretch. And so I had been watching movies my whole life and I had just been consuming, consuming stories. And I thought, you know, this is really important. And maybe I want to work in film someday, but I'm probably just going to be a lawyer like my favorite television show, Living Single. I'm going to be Maxine Shaw, played by the great Erica Alexander. So I went to Dartmouth College and I took a class. I took intro to film and I took African-American cinema. And that class changed my life. Number one, I didn't really know that you could teach film. I didn't know that you could teach you know, particularly Black film history. And so when I got the books, I read them twice for fun. And I said, oh, there's something here in the water. I mean, it's Dartmouth. We're already nerds. But like the nerds on nerds situation that ended up adding to it meant that I was so compelled by the subject matter. So I ended up majoring in film and television at Dartmouth and then went straight to get my PhD at UCLA. And what's really powerful when you think about this global medium is that it's, and this is also not just film, but also television, it's a mass medium, is that it's an unparalleled cultural tool, part of a larger cultural institution and a cultural industry. So being able to study it is really to study not just art and artifacts, but also an industry that has a business, an economic, a politic, a history. And so it was so rich um, and complex and at the same time made me the most interesting person at any dinner party because I could always be like, so like, what are you watching? And then there was a good chance I was watching it too because I don't get outside. And so I just really love being able to talk about this stuff. And that's really what kind of drove is that I could do this and then I could teach students about this, that it was more than just the thing that they liked, but that they could have a really rich conversation. Now I'm wondering if anybody has ever said, oh my God, my favorite film is Citizen Kane. <laughs> yes, people do. <laughs> okay. People do. Usually because they're trying to impress me and I have to say, you know, yeah, maybe I'm, like... I'm me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that's great because it is a really important and significant film. And just to kind of get back now, yeah. like you mentioned, you went to UCLA. What was it like to have, you know, Hollywood in your backyard, essentially, and studying film and media? Oh, my God. I absolutely loved it. First of all, when you go to L.A., you already have to play it cool because you're just walking around and seeing stars all the time. And you just have to say, you know, this is just normal life. I'm not going to run up on them right now. And then UCLA is really fantastic in part because it's a professional school and it has a critical study side. So I was training and learning the history of film and media and television all together alongside folks who were learning directing, cinematography and screenwriting. And so there was a real strong appreciation for craft. And then we would see them go out there and do their work in the world. And also we would see folks from the industry come into the classroom and come into the school and talk about the industry itself. So it was really lovely just to be able to be in kind of an rich environment. And then we also remember that L.A. is filled with all, not all of, the, that's that's um, a misnomer right there I'm about to say, but filled with so many great archives. So you have the Margaret Herrick Library, which is the archive that is maintained by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. That's the Oscars folks. And what they end up doing is they they end up basically having these huge files on basically every film. And so you could go and find out all this interesting stuff about all of these old films because they kept, you know, the correspondence between the studios and, and the producers and the directors. And so if you're saying, why was this film looking like this? You can go back and see the cast list. You can see handwritten notes when they were, you know, during the production code era, which is Hollywood's period of like extreme censorship. Mm -hmm. You can go see the ways they tried to make changes to like be able to fall into the production code like rules. And my favorite is when I teach, I teach the film of Im Imitation of Life, the 1939 John Stahl version. Um, and what you can see is this is after the production code has started and they're trying to get away with the fact that Imitation of Life deals with an interracial storyline between two mothers who work together to deal with the Depression era. And then there's a young light skinned girl named Piola, played by the actress, the black actress, Freddie Washington. And what's so interesting about this is it's obvious that she's black. We know she's black, but she's playing a young girl who wants to pass. And so there was all this concern from um, Joseph Breen um, um, at the studio, not at the studio, Joseph Breen basically writing, saying, 
we need to make sure that everybody knows that she's black, even though she looks white and she wants to be. So they wrote in there, it's like, you all have to really make sure that this is not a story of miscegenation because we can't have that. We can't have mixed race. That's one of the prohibited rules. And so what they ended up basically doing is putting the throwaway line in there where they say, Piola, she's a product of a very, she has a very light, light, light skinned pappy. So that way they can kind of deal with the fact that she looks white. And, and that's what she's also talking about. It's having these yearnings, what she wants to be as white like she looks, which isn't actually wanting to be white. She just wants white opportunities. This is 1939. She wants to be able to go and do what she wants to do without having race be a barrier for her. So it's great to be able to go to the Herrick and see all these kinds of um, wonderful materials um, on Hollywood history. So you get to see stars, you get to be you know, in an industry conversation, but you also get to be, have this rich resource between them and the UCLA Film and Television Archive is the second biggest archive, only second to the Library of Congress. So you can imagine, you know, they have, you know, television programs. So you want to see what's happening during the Watts Revolt in 1965, the way that television programming was covering that revolt. They have the footage. You can go back and look and really see what kinds of discourses were happening around sort of major social events. And so it's really exciting. It was an exciting time to be doing my work there. It's bringing back memories for me of seeing like, you know, small clips of some of the Watts riots and things like mm -hmm. that. And I'm interested to know what impact Birth of a Nation had on, just as a quick follow up, on African Americans in Hollywood and, you know, developing movies and everything like that. It seems a lot of us get our, you know, understanding of the world based off the media that we watch. Of course. I mean, there's no film that hasn't had a long standing that has not had a longer standing impact than The Birth of a Nation. And if you asked D.W. E. Griffith if we were to reincarnate him right now, which I'm sort of like, no, nah, we're good on that. But if we were to ask him, he, you know, he was vehemently opposed to the idea that his film was racist. And D.W. E. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation is based on the book by Thomas Dixon called The Klansman, which was really a desire for him, Dixon, Griffith, and Woodrow Wilson really to cement the idea that there was the need for the Ku Klux Klan, that there was a need for a white vigilante group to restore social order post-Reconstruction. So the fact that The Birth of a Nation was the first film to be screened at the White House, and then Woodrow Wilson would later call this film History Ridden in Lightning, despite the fact that it was a complete warping of historical fact, is really significant. Number one, it tells you the importance of film as a culture industry, that it would be aligned with our political systems, that it would be in the White House. And number two, that it would create particular characters that would reverberate historically even to this day. So we have longstanding figures like the Mammy, longstanding figures like the Black Buck, meaning some like lascivious, hyper-aggressive, hyper-masculine Black male figures who, who would be a threat to white womanhood. We have the figure of, you know, the racialized coon or the, which is kind of a jokester, jester, but a comical black figure, but where the, the comedy is racialized in very particular ways. And then, of course, the tragic mulatto figure, which we see that common refrain come up when it's particularly with mixed race actors and actresses. And so the way that has shaped the kinds of stereotypes, the pervasive stereotypes and iconography throughout film history, we could always say, well, I swear I saw Mammy in the 1950s. I swear I saw mm -hmm. one now. Yeah. I swear I saw the same kind of trope, is that mm -hmm. there's a historical legacy of those kinds of images. But it's also a legacy because Birth of a Nation was so stunning visually. It was synthesizing so many film formal choices that had not been synthesized before. It was like one reels, like, so, you know, maybe 30 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. And now we are in a three-hour epic film that is using close-up melodrama, full dramatic storytelling, cross-cutting, and parallel editing. So you emotionally are caught up and swelled with the fact that you get, you end up feeling a narratively positioned to root for the KKK in this film. And it's done so expertly through how he's cutting back and forth between a family in peril and the rescue mission of the clan. And so when I say What's so important about all of the film techniques and film form that the history of cinema is so implicated in a question of race and how to also be a potential, a potential apparatus of racial harm that we can't divorce or divest those two. And so when we think about the history of cinema, we have to think about the ways in which film can be used as modes of racial redress or also potentially used for modes of racial harm. So that's something I think is part of the legacy of Birth of a Nation, is that 
It created character tropes and a history of being able to have a very seductive, persuasive form make us not really even question the kinds of racialized imagery and the racial harm of really filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you mentioned was some of the films being developed at Tuskegee and uh, these other HBCUs. And a lot of us obviously can name some very old, you know, major directors, the Sergei Eisensteins, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but one name that may not come to mind for most people when it comes to filmmakers is, I think I'm going to be butchering it, but Oscar Michaud. No, you nailed it. Oh, perfect. <laughs> nailed it. What was his impact on the movie industry as a whole, or the film industry, rather? Oh, wow. That's, a, that's such a really important question, because Oscar Michaud comes at a really important time, and it's actually a really wonderful rejoinder to the birth of a nation question, because his 1920 film, Within Our Gates, is often thought to be kind of a response to the racial lies of Birth of a Nation. So Oscar Michaud is really an entrepreneur, a filmmaker, a novelist. He wrote seven novels. He made over 40 films, though we only have a small selection of them. But he made films during a period of time that started in the 1910s and went all the way to the 1940s. But the reason why we don't have them is for a couple of reasons. Number one is that during this period of time, people were making films, but they didn't really think that how you have to kind of preserve them. Like film preservation requires controlled temperature rooms when things are shot on nitrate. You can't have them any place. They could be flammable. Yeah. So when we think about the history of in this time period, I'm talking about silent cinema. But silent cinema, we have actually lost. This is not just in terms of black filmmaking. I'm just talking about film in general. We've lost a huge percentage of films because they were just not preserved, because we didn't know what this industry was. This was a new medium. This was like having fun right now. It's basically like doing TikToks and Snapchats. You don't know what you're supposed to be preserving, what you're supposed to be archiving. So Michaud makes a bunch of films, and we have only a few of them that we can actually see. But he made them particularly during a time where you couldn't really work in Hollywood. So he had to self-finance his own works. He would travel with his own works, and he would make films as part of a period of time that we would call race films. So him. People like the Lincoln Motion Picture Company, figures like Spencer Williams, who was also a director and actor, they would go around and we call them race films. So it makes it sound like they're black films. But when we say race films, it usually was black actors, sometimes sort of a black showman, but it was white money. So it was usually sort of interracial cooperative ventures with Oscar was a little bit different, but he self-financed these films that were basically meant to be for black audiences. That would also usually have a kind of moralistic or educational, pedagogical tale. So they were for like middle class values, you know, teaching black people things like why education is really important. A very sort of a mix between Du Boisian and like a Booker T. Washington kind of ethos, like so total full bootstraps, but like talented tech version of it. So he was just a prolific race filmmaker who really navigated the exclusion of an industry by basically creating his own pathway. And we are thankful to even have his films because of, like I said, the issues of preservation. In fact, the film I described within our gates from 1920 was thought to be lost all the way up until 1990 when it was found in Spain. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah, so they basically had to redub the film back. And we know we're missing parts of it because of the title cards are a little off. But it's a rich trove. And he's one of many who we would call race filmmakers who made films for black audiences, particularly um, because at the time you couldn't go to the theater. There was no interracial theater going. So these are segregated black audiences. And he made them about black people and black lives and told black stories. So he really is like the forefather or one of the forefathers. He's not the first black filmmaker, but. Um, one of the forefathers of Black filmmaking. So for you, I'm wondering, is there a Jackie Robinson as far as, mm. you know, Black actor or Black actresses go who kind of broke that glass ceiling or who really made it into the mainstream? That's a great, first of all, I love always just pointing this out. Jackie Robinson also was in the movies. He starred as himself, though Jackie Robinson was a Jackie Robinson in the Jackie oh, wow. Robinson story. Yes. <laughs> It's a really interesting film. Number one, he's way too old to be playing his younger version of himself in the film. Ruby Dee's in this film opposite him. It was basically very soon after the book, The Jackie Robinson Story, came out by Arthur Mann. And it's a really interesting film. But in terms of what Jackie Robinson represents, in terms of breaking color barriers, that really has to be the domain of Sidney Poitier. And I was really grateful um, is that when Sidney Poitier passed, I had a chance to write the um, kind of it's not an obituary, but kind of a critical conversation post his death for The Atlantic. And it was really talking about the impact that he made because he was, in certain ways, really the first Black crossover star. 
And I mean, crossover star as in like both celebrated, not because we've had other crossover stars who have been appreciated, but partially because they may have been caricatured. But he was the first crossover star who, um, he won an Oscar, you know, he, he played this dignified figure often. And that's both to his gain and to his, and, and to a little bit of a, a constraint, meaning that he wasn't allowed to be a fully fleshed human being always. But he did so in a way that, that reinscripted what black masculinity was on screen. Mm-hmm. Um, and for many people was the only black person that they knew, even if they did not actually know him mm-hmm. in the ways that film and television can create a level of intimacy between actor and audience that we should always be critical of, but is really an important one. And he really broke barriers for Black actors in terms of Hollywood and also the terms of roles that he played, but also in the fact that he was able to blend his artistry with his activism and was really um, really a sort of a public and outspoken person while balancing the extreme burden of really being the first. And since then, we've had many Sydneys, and that's where we get our lineage of our, our Denzels, the late Chadwick Bosemans, um, you know, those what would have been, you know, Will Smith, like that's, that's his lineage, um, is these really impactful crossover box office, big success figures. Mm-hmm. That was Sydney Poitier first. Yeah, those two really hurt losing Sydney and then Chadwick. Yeah. I feel like it was in the same year or something. It was, just it, was like, it was tough. I mean, it was and, a tough year. Yeah. You know, and as we're thinking about, you know, the roles actors and actresses have played throughout the history of Hollywood, I'm wondering how has the depiction of maybe Black life changed throughout the history of Hollywood and throughout the history of film and cinema as a whole? Yeah, I mean, I think that, again, to go back to Birth of a Nation, not to have it have this strong hold on us, but, you know, Birth of a Nation inscripted a plantation genre, which put Black people often into a pastoral world. And not in just in terms of subservience, but also sometimes in narratives that kept them away from questions of sort of modernity or being contemporary figures in idyllic spaces. That's one of the interesting things of like a film like Cabin in the Sky, because they're removed from white worlds. And so Hollywood also got really into telling Black stories where Black people were in all Black worlds. And so they were removed from an integrated society, because that's also part of a social move is that a separate but equal kind of ethos. And so what we've seen is sort of this adoption of integration in terms of narrative, in terms of you know, co-stars, but also in terms of the ways we think about the world's connecting. And so what we've also seen is um, Hollywood and independent filmmakers and particularly Black directors wanting to tell much more richer stories of Black life. And that would be stories that would range, that would cover Black historical events, Black contemporary figures, Black dreams, Black hopes, Black speculations. And that's what's been really exciting is really seeing the ways in which particularly Black directors have opened up conversations of of wanting to show Black people not have to be perfect, number one. So that's a little bit the Sidney Poitier effect is that they don't have to be perfect. Wanting to explore Black historical past. So I think of Barry Jenkins, absolutely stunning and underwatch. Go out and watch it, people. Underground Railroad based on Colson Whitehood's, um, um, maybe I made have said his last name wrong, but based on the novel that he turned into an entire adapted series for Amazon. It's the most, it's hard to watch. And I think I understand my audience, particularly Black audience, say, I don't want to go back and watch stories about slavery. You know, I don't want this and, and not critically say things like, oh, it's trauma porn. But like, we're, we're it's, it's a past. And if you don't think that there was laughter on the plantation, you don't understand the humanity of Black experience. Um, so it's a really deep and rich text. So I think that we're seeing um, folks and also to imagine the one place that I think we still don't always want to, but shout out to my Discovery fans, and that I'm talking about Star Trek Discovery, is Black people in the future. So we're looking still for more, you know, imaginations of Black people who exist in the future and how we might imagine Black futures, which is something I'm hoping we'll see more of in terms of, of media making. But now we're just seeing Black people integrated into worlds, and that's mm-hmm. really great. You know, one thing I'm thinking about is, like, you know, like you mentioned, obviously, you know, looking back on our history and like with the Amazon series, it is hard to watch our history sometimes, but it's history. History mm-hmm. is sometimes not easy to digest. I'm wondering what film or even television show would you say had the biggest impact on the shift in portrayal of Black life? Wow. I mean, I think in that sense, and not to have this podcast be sponsored by slavery, but sorry, can we say that this month? But nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, she persisted. It has to be Roots. Roots mm-hmm. changed television. It was the most watched television series in the history. It was like the most watched TV show, TV anything in the history of television. 
as a miniseries. It brought together white, black, every audience, and they sat down and had to reckon that fact that they weren't watching black history, they were watching their history. And that was already a complexity. And so Roots also change the fact that if you've ever seen Roots, you know how many Black actors, certain actresses are in this work. Um, and it's just so rich, compelling. So we have like the history of Black film and television in terms of acting labor in this film, in this miniseries, excuse me. And so, but it basically also talked about the viability of Black stories, that there could be an investment in here that people will come out and watch, because that's also one of the big unfortunate um, Hollywood illusions, which is that Blackness, people won't come out and watch and Blackness won't sell. And then we know, we say, why are we sending these people all around the country? Because people will go see anything, number one. And number two is that also we have a history of people showing up and showing out, whether that's turning on their TV and then getting the Nielsen ratings or actually going to the box office and making Black Panther, you know, a global success is that people will watch. But it's actually Roots. Roots fundamentally change people's understanding of the capacity to deal with Black stories. And in fact, that Black stories may have to deal with pain or deal with a history of racial violence, but also would deal with family, overcoming stories of love, stories of preservation, stories of hope. I mean, life. Mm -hmm. So that was Roots. So it's so amazing. Love Roots. And I kind of want to shift gears a little bit kind of towards present day. And Mm -hmm. I promise audience, I know I'm not going to make this keynote into a funeral, (laughs) but we recently lost Apollo Creed, Carl Weathers, Mm -hmm. great actor, Chubbs, everything. Thinking about other actors and actresses around his age, you know, many of them obviously are extremely iconic. What connection can we draw between, you know, Carl Weathers' generation of actors and actresses and this new upcoming generation of actors and actresses? So, you know, Michael B. Jordans and everybody else. That's such a great question, in part because Carl Weathers comes actually as part of a particular cohort that we don't always recognize. And as a person who um, writes not just about African American cinema and television, who also writes about sports films. I have a deep investment in both the Rocky franchise, but also in um, understanding that there was a large number of Black athletes who became actors. And that includes Carl Weathers, um, Canada Lee, who would play in Body and Soul, another boxing film, people like Willie Strode, who would later be nominated for an Academy Award for Spartacus. Even, like I said, Jackie Robinson, you know, acted, so did Joe Lewis. But there was just this huge number of Oh, of course, you know, Paul Robeson was a Renaissance athlete in general and would become, you know, a great orator, singer, actor. But so it was this huge crop of folks who were basically coming out of sports in general, in part because of this hyper fascination with the hyper masculinity of blackness and all these kinds of interesting, I would say, caveats that that end up becoming really exciting, great actors. And what we saw was the ways in which they really could elevate text and change text in really important ways. And to think about, particularly with the Rocky franchise, how important Carl Weathers is as a character. Not Carl Weathers, the actor, but Carl Weathers. (laughs) Carl Weathers' character is to the entire series, but the figure of Creed that Mm -hmm. would later, of course, be inspiration for Ryan Coogler to go back and then to reach out to Sly Stallone and saying, I want to re-engage with this topic and make Creed with Michael B. Jordan. So what we see is this really interesting, what I would say is a kind of, citational practice and historical awareness of our actors and actresses these days, kind of thinking about the legacy between them and other really important films and figures. And so I think there's an interesting through line to think about, of course, Carl Weathers and a Michael B. Jordan, who then plays, you know, his son of sorts in terms of lineages, if we want to go the patrilineal way. But just in general, I think that nowadays, especially maybe because we're in the period of reboots and remakes, is that we think about with the remake of The Color Purple, is that there's kind of the cyclical nature that's also happening between our older actors and our younger actresses. I think that there's an awareness in terms of the relationship between current Black actors and actresses. Mm-hmm. With it being award season, I definitely wanted to, you know, ask you a, a little bit about the awards. You know, obviously there are tons and tons of actors, some that come to mind, the Viola Davises, mm-hmm. the Morgan Freemans, who mm-hmm. do a billion films, but it seems like they never really get the credit that they deserve mm-hmm. almost. I think Maybe Morgan Freeman only has won an Academy Award or something. Do you think that'll ever change in the future where, you know, these iconic actors and actresses will eventually get something, obviously, before they pass? That's such a great question. I think about that, especially in context of, you know, this Academy season with Angela Bassett, even particularly being nominated the previous year. for And it felt sort of long time coming because she lost out with What's Love Got to Do With It? 
right? And then we think, you know, we're finally, she's going to get to the stage and then she loses, right? And she loses to another person who's also had a long Hollywood career, Jamie Lee Curtis. And then she's now given this honorary Oscar, right? And do I think that, I don't want to be unhopeful, but I do think that past is prologue. And I think that the Hollywood, I think that Hollywood sometimes gets a rap that it's, you know, a very progressive industry and it's, you know, always moving forward. But it's actually not at the avant-garde of many things. And it's certainly not in terms of inclusion and also in terms of recognition. Something that really struck me recently in these conversations about compensation and also about recognition is when Viola Davis was you know, explaining to everyone that I'm the black Meryl Streep. Like, you know, the roles I've done, the training I've had, the awards I've been in, the things I've done, but I don't get offers. Like I'm not fielding a bunch of offers. And therefore, if you're not fielding a bunch of offers, you're not fielding a bunch of moments of recognition either. And Hollywood has just never been on the pulse of recognizing Black genius, both in terms of acting, but also in terms of directing, in terms of screenwriting, in terms of casting, in terms of lighting, in terms of all of the categories. And we can say, I always use the example of the film by Cassie Lemons from 1997, Eve's Bayou which got written up in popular press with people saying, is it too good to be a Black film? He didn't know what to do with it. It's a period piece. It's with Sam Jackson. This is one of his good ones, right? And it stars a young Journey Smollett and Lynn Whitfield. And it's, you know, it's, it's set in, in Louisiana. It's rich. It's so good. It's like, it's also one of my favorite films. And it's got wonderful, beautiful acting. And it's, in that sense, it was shocking to people because it was Black people in the historical past, but it wasn't slavery. Mm-hmm. So they were just, you know, dressed well, but like with like, you know, Sam Jackson was philandering. Like that was the problem. That was a conflict. Right. And there was like an element of food. Like there's a history there and all this stuff. And it's so good. And people didn't know what to do. And it was not, it was nominated for Spirit Awards. It was not nominated at all at the Oscars. And there's a lot of reasons things aren't nominated. People don't realize it's not just a popularity campaign. I mean, it's a campaign. Like your studio has to campaign for it. So when things like 12 Years a Slave was nominated for its Oscars, for which, you know, Lupita won. And like, you know, there was a lot of recognition around the, the play, another play, the film itself. It's in part because it was produced by A24, which was produced, one of the big names of A24 is Brad Pitt and his plan B. So Brad Pitt does the work that you have to do when you want to get work nominated and potentially recognized, which is basically, you remember when you were in high school and if you said you wanted to run for student council, you basically had to start lobbying all your friends. That's what this is. You have to go around and lobby all your friends. You have to go take them around and make them sit down and watch the film and say, let me introduce you to this. Lupita. You have to really, you have to work for it. It's a campaign. And so some of the smaller works and the really interesting things like A, A to B Rockwell's new film, 1001, I think it's called, starring Tiana oh. Taylor. So good, right? That, that film, you know, you, if you don't have the same kind of infrastructural campaign machine that a studio has behind the work, you don't have people pushing that. How is she not nominated? For this role, mm-hmm. when you have other works of different varying calibers, and, and this is already again subjective, we're judging art. <laughs> but so I think it's going to be, I think it's really going to still be quite difficult because some of the great work is still happening by independent folk and they don't have the kind of studio backing and campaign machines to be able to get that kind of recognition and breakthrough. And then the fact of the matter is that people are still creating work for white audiences only. I'm not terribly optimistic. But I'm always very hopeful for the times that people are able to break through and we get to see great actors like Sterling K. Brown, who I think is really, he's to me the the head of the class of the new generation of actors who have an extreme range. If you were with Sterling K. Brown on Army Wives, if you're watching Lifetime with me watching Army Wives, you know that man can act. So, but he has shown this with American fiction. He's not even in the film that much. So scene stealing, good, just rich everything in the face he knows what he's doing but we knew that because this is us that man had us crying every 15 minutes he had to stop watching for my emotional health right so you know so we have so many great actors who i hope get a chance to be nominated and to dazzle on the stage and, and be recognized because we know that they're really brilliant it's funny you mentioned that. i was talking to my wife because we saw it and i was like why didn't they give me more sterling k brown <laughs> like i love jeffrey Wright; yeah. he's great but i was like you gotta give me more sterling k brown in this film so like good. you know he's so doing good. multiple movies with his schedule like mm-hmm. just 
couple more scenes. He's so, um, He's so good. But we, you know, you touched on Angela Davis. Yes. I had mentioned Viola Davis. We just got a great question in that was submitted by Lester. So Lester asks, what needs to be done to have more voices of Black women in film, not just as sidekicks? That's such a great question. And I would say a couple of different things. Number one is that we want to recognize that Black film and particularly Black women's film does not just exist in Hollywood. And so one of the ways we can kind of keep ourselves aware of how and who is making film is to really open ourselves beyond what we see, you know, come to the local regal or multiplex and that there's a strong tradition of Black women's independent filmmaking and particularly Black women's experimental filmmaking. And so you want to also hit things like the festival scene. So there's a wonderful festival that happens in Philadelphia called Black Star, which brings particularly global Black voices and Black filmmakers into a conversation. And so you end up getting to see work that may not be able to be picked up for distribution, may not then get to stream on Amazon or Apple TV or Netflix. And you have, you know, collectives like um, Third Horizon and the New Negress Film Society who are not interested in Hollywood. They're interested in supporting Black women filmmakers who want to work on the fringe or work on the side. But I also think it's really about opening up the gates. And this is actually not a question for Black women or Black folks in general, but it's for those who are in charge. Because sometimes we put the onerous on, well, why aren't you in better films or why aren't you doing things? And we have to realize we've got to change the gatekeepers or the gatekeepers have to be a bit more inclusive. So it's really about thinking about who's running all these studios, who's gatekeeping, who's taking risk. And Issa Rae was just profiled saying, these Hollywood folks are not taking risk anymore. They're going for the simple formulaic stuff. And even she's finding obstacles and barriers. And she's proven herself in all these different and distinct ways. And so it's really about gatekeepers opening up the gate because we're going to be creative and we're going to be geniuses. And we're also going to be able to put, and also diversity is good big business. You mentioned Issa Rae, and I'm kind of thinking about, I love her, by the way, yeah. she's amazing. I'm thinking about, you know, obviously you had mentioned Chad, Chadwick Boseman as well. Is there, or who would you say is the next big actor or actress when it comes to African Americans in Hollywood? Um, would you say there's one or a couple, or is there one that stands out to you? I think right now we, in terms of Hollywood's metrics, I think in terms of bankability, critical acclaim, and has had this huge crossover appeal, which is what also Sidney Poitier had, is Zendaya. Zendaya is a figure, she's in these huge, big budget films, your dunes, but she gets to also be on television, right? She's in Euphoria, she's won awards, she's won Emmys. She has this sort of critical cachet, but hasn't lost it in a way that so many people still love her. Like you can't, you know, nobody can say anything bad about her. No, I wouldn't. I love her. But she's really somebody to watch. And she has an interesting legacy and lineage with another sort of trailblazer like Halle Berry. Right. So also, you know, a mixed race actress who is navigating the kind of stereotypical ways in which black women get framed and reframed in Hollywood lens. But she's a really important figure. I also think in terms of Thinking about means of production, I'm really interested in the work that Ryan Coogler is doing as a director and therefore how he's also emboldening other folks like Michael B. Jordan to take up directing mm -hmm. and not just worry about being in front of the camera, but really being really skilled in multiple ways, meaning to create and make your own stories. Just in terms of full crossover appeal and can play to white audiences, can play to black audiences. It hasn't been stymied by the quote unquote, how can blackness travel global questions in terms of big work? It would just be Zendaya. And I think it's also a youth factor. She really has done something really interesting with using her youth, but also her savvy to create really interesting, sumptuous roles. But I'd love to see more really great roles. There's Daniel Deadweiler, who most people don't, she played Emmett Till's mom in Till. Um, oh, yes. She was also in The Harder They Fall. Love that movie. Yes. Yeah. So she was so good in it. And also a, a dark skinned Black actress, really great. But I know that when I say she will have a harder uphill battle. Um, in terms of the roles and the access because of how um, gender, beauty, and race shape the limited roles that women in general can be able to access. But she's someone who you want to look out for because she's really doing some interesting things on screen. And she's got a film coming up with Aldris Hodge in The Hodge Brothers. Um, I think it's going to straight to streaming. Um, nobody's paying me for any of this, so check out all the platforms to figure that out. But yeah, there's just some really interesting people. But it's Zendaya, it's the late Chadwick Boseman, who just, who's, I think death haunts us all because we could see it. He was many things and he was everything all at once. And 
a true gifted person. And then, of course, our Viola Davis, who is, we hope to see her be many things. I want to see her chew the scenery. I want to see her. I, I loved her and, you know, how to get away with murder, just committing mm -hmm. crimes daily. That was amazing. But, you know, just, was amazing. just getting those so little law good. schools to kill those kids. And <laughs> you got to, I mean, I don't sanction violence, but if you're going to do it, you know, yeah. um, do, do it in a Shonda Rhimes vehicle. Dr. Shepard, thank you so much. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss new episodes as they are released wherever you listen to podcasts. To learn more about eCornell's online courses and on-campus programs, check out the episode notes for more information. Whether you're a busy professional or an impassioned lifelong learner, there's sure to be something that suits your goals and interests. Thank you for listening.